This episode is brought to you by Preborn. For just $28, you could be the difference between the life or death of a baby. To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash Candace. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Today on the show, we have Tucker Carlson versus Ben Shapiro. Ah! Yes, the conservative world is on fire. Whose side are you on? Plus, Rachel Dolezal is back in the news, and I have to tell you guys right now, I am a Rachel Dolezal stan. I gotta tell you why. But first, I have a very important message to my Jewish friends. All that and more today, coming up on Candace Owens. All right, so you guys may have seen some of this on my Instagram stories this morning because I woke up and I was so frustrated and also incensed when I saw a clip circulating from our show and people were tagging me and saying stuff like this. Look at this Instagram post. This person writes, well done, at Real Candace Owens. Keep confirming your true colors and you can go and join your BFF at Kanye West with your anti-Semitic stance against Israel. And then you can see that they have taken a clip from the show. Obviously, it's completely out of context, and that's the point of it. And they've even painted a clown face onto me. And then the person writes over that clip, Clown Candace Owens, Israel's Super Bowl hostage ads were propaganda as Netanyahu bombed a refugee camp. Why would we call our rep to do something that has nothing to do with America? By the way, that is an actual quotation that I did say. Why would we call our reps to do something that has nothing to do with America? So just to recap, because as I said, obviously this was taken out of context. People don't know what show this is from. People also who are circulating this clip don't listen to my podcast. And the purpose of them doing that sort of underhanded trick is to make them angry, even if they don't really know necessarily what they're angry about. Now, for those of you that listen to my show, you know that as a regular beat, We constantly talk about the emotional engineering in our society, the emotional engineering that's taking place in American society that's meant to make us want to support causes, whether it's at home, like you should feel bad for an illegal alien and we should be funding this even though it is to our detriment or and especially abroad. It gets especially senseless when we are being emotionally manipulated to want to support causes overseas. And I didn't support our money being sent to Afghanistan. I did not support our money being sent to Ukraine. I did not support, therefore, our money being sent to Israel. And I've especially been harsh when it comes to Ukraine. When that conflict broke out, don't forget, Ukraine was doing so much propaganda at that time, particularly Zelensky. Remember this photo that I absolutely lambasted? Zelensky with his wife for Vogue. What is that? Why are you on the cover of Vogue? If you are in a very serious war, you shouldn't make time for this. And then, of course, we had the Associated Press, and he was all dressed up in army fatigues. Again, emotional manipulation. He's not fighting on the front lines. Why is he wearing army fatigues at all? Wear a suit. Billions and billions of dollars being sent there. And lastly, and this made me especially frustrated, when Zelensky appeared at the Grammys. What an absurdity. This is an American entertainment show. It's supposed to be an entertainment show, and it should be completely void of any sorts of overseas propaganda. So, of course, in the context of how I feel about this sort of a thing, it makes perfect sense that I would say that NGOs and the Israeli government should not be creating ads telling us that we need to call our senators, call our congressmen, and demand more funding for Israel, demand more support for Israel. That doesn't make sense. We are in America. It's very simple. So I want to tell you guys a couple of things about my childhood. By the way, these are just facts, and and it's important that I share this with you uh, so I can make a very clear point to people that wish to take me out of context. I grew up in what just happens to be a very Jewish town. It's just outside of New York City. It's Stamford, Connecticut. We therefore had a Jewish community center and I would go to a lot of my friends' birthday parties where they would host at that community center. My best friend in middle school just happened to be Jewish. Her name was Jessie. My best friend in high school just happened to be Jewish. Her name is Denise. We are still great friends. I was in her wedding, she was in mine. My best friend in college was also Jewish. Her name is Ashley. I am still friends with her, and I would always go back with her to Massachusetts and celebrate Rosh Hashanah with her and her grandparents and her mother and her father, very close to them. 
I actually, I could say throughout my life, I have definitively done so many Rosh Hashanah dinners. It's, it's strange, honestly. I've spent, I've done more Rosh Hashanah dinners, I would say, than any person should that is not Jewish. When I got out of college, I had tons of debt, needed a job immediately, and I found one on the Upper East Side temporarily nannying for a family, a Jewish family, a very observant Jewish family, who sent their kids to a school that was called Rodef Shalom. Yes, this meant also that every Friday I was there for their Shabbat dinners. My best friend at that time was a girl named Jordana, also Jewish, also someone that I spent Rosh Hashanah dinner with. And I was also dating a man, not kidding, for two years, and I lived with him. I don't advocate for that now, young ladies, but I lived with my boyfriend at the time, and he was a Jewish man, and we had mezuzahs on every door in our apartment. Then I got a job, a real-world job, working in private equity for four years. I happened to work at a firm, a small firm that was run by two Jewish men. And I say all the time how grateful I am for those experiences. It was my first real opportunity in life because I was able to work myself out of student loan debt. I was able to learn about finance, crucial part of my upbringing, and also just admiring the success that they had was very motivating to me, seeing them take a chance on themselves. They were two guys out of Goldman Sachs who were taking a chance on themselves in their own private equity firm, and they worked so diligently and so hard, and I knew, I wanna, I wanna mimic this. This is, this is incredible. I also was able to travel the world uh, doing other things for one of the partners of the firm, and I got to see Europe. It just, it, it transformed me. Stepping outside of your own country on somebody else's dime, what an opportunity. It, it changed who I am, and it changed my philosophies in life, really. I would say it's a big reason why I am a conservative today. But the point that I want to make is throughout my entire life, so many Jewish people, I had never heard any of those individuals that I just mentioned refer to someone as an anti-Semite or refer to someone as a Jew hater. Actually, looking back, all of them had pretty good lives. So why would they do that? Why would they want to victimize themselves or refer to people that were treating them well as something that they're not? I had never seen that before in my entire life, right? Until I got into politics. And I gotta be honest, I didn't understand it at first. I was, I was trying to reconcile the Jewish people that I grew up with and who I love, and who are my friends, and who are my ex-boyfriend, I guess you would say, with this sort of DC Jew who was using these words, not because they believed that what they were hearing was actually anti-Semitism or Jew hating, but to basically silence people. They were threatening people. What I started to recognize and what I now understand is that just like black people are not a monolith, Jewish people are not a monolith. There are all different types of Jewish people. And this particular people that I've been talking about, that I'm talking about right now, represent a fringe minority of Jewish people that want nothing more than political power. It is just like Black Lives Matter. These people are ultimately Marxists, okay? And when Black Lives Matter was going around calling everybody racist, it was this implicit threat to white people. Do what we say, do what we want, or we will ruin your life. That was the intention. We will ruin your effing life by smearing and libeling you and making other black people who actually aren't radicals believe that you are, in fact, racist. That is the two-prong approach, because why else would you do this? Why else would you refer to someone who is so clearly and evidentially not a Jew hater as one? Because you want power. You want to also make Jewish people paranoid, right? You start using words like the Holocaust is going to be back. And, and of course, if you're a Jewish person, you hear that. You, you want to go, oh, my gosh, like, what is it? What should we be fighting? I want, I, we got to fight that thing because I don't want another Holocaust. And it's the same thing with BLM, right? You, you, they go to black people and they freak them out. And they say, oh, my gosh, you got to join our movement or slavery is going to be back. You're going to be back in chains. Of course, that's not reality. That's not real. That is emotional manipulation and the worst kind. It's evil is what it is. These individuals are evil Marxists. They do underhanded things, underhanded tactics to freak people out and to ultimately cause division, right? Their goal is that they are willing to hurt regular, hardworking Jewish Americans so that they can gain political power. That's what they're doing. Again, these people are Marxists, and I reserve such disdain for these individuals. I don't hate Jewish people. I hate bad people, and these people are bad and Jewish people, I want to invite you to call these people out in the same way that when my community had rot in it, I was willing to call them out, right? 
I said BLM is a Marxist organization. Ultimately, they are going to hurt the black community and inspire people to actually feel racism because you're constantly threatening them. You're not allowing them to speak. You're not allowing them to say what they think without trying to ruin their lives. Yeah, this is going to be the end result if Jewish people don't start standing up to these people that are behaving like monsters in your community. They shouldn't do it. We all should have the right to weed out bad people in our community because on the left and on the right, there are bad people. And ultimately what their goal is, is submission. Basically what these people are saying is you will submit to our political philosophy or I will ruin your life, Candace. Now, I want to be very clear on what my political philosophy is because I feel like it's not a very difficult one to comprehend. So I'm going to at first point to my colleague Matt Walsh's tweet. He wrote this on Twitter. Sorry, I should say X yesterday. He wrote, foreign aid by definition is taxation without representation. Taxpayers are funding foreign governments without any say in how the funds are used. This country was literally formed to stop that sort of injustice. The whole system of foreign aid is corrupt, immoral, and evil. He goes on and he writes, it should fill you with rage to think that food is being taken off of your children's plates and sent directly to foreign bureaucrats to be used however they see fit in ways that will not remotely benefit you or your family. The whole thing is completely insane. I can't believe anyone supports it. I certainly do not support it least of all when it makes zero economic sense. So I would now like to invite you to the tweets of Congressman Thomas Massey. He wrote this, the national debt is increasing at 318 million per an hour. That means the debt is piling up at about $1 per an hour per a U.S. citizen, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Imagine trying to work off this debt. He then shows a video of just how quickly Americans are going into debt. Look at this video. It's crazy. There it is. That's the U.S. national debt, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to be clear, I can barely say that number. It almost gives me numerical dyslexia. That's how long it's gotten. You should be outraged that that number keeps going up because people want to send money overseas. You should be outraged that they're trying to pull out your heartstrings when, listen, maybe I would be open to sending money overseas if I didn't look around me and see America in full decline. If I walked through neighborhoods and everything was perfectly paved and people were mowing and waving and everything looked clean and normal and we had a low crime incidence and our borders were secured, maybe you could bring me to the point where I say, you know what, we have so much that we should share it for things that we believe matter in our country. But that isn't the circumstance right now. Thomas Massey also authored this tweet. He wrote, the speaker just announced that next week the House will vote on a clean bill to send Israel $14.3 billion. Israel has a lower debt to GDP ratio than the United States. This spending package has no offsets, so it will increase our debt by $14.3 billion plus interest. That makes zero economic sense. As I said earlier on Instagram, this would be like Basically, I have $1 million in my account. You have $9 in your account, and I come to you to borrow some money. That would be foolish. That would be stupid. So why aren't we applying that economic common sense when it comes to sending money overseas? Not wanting to do that is, like I said, common sense. It is not anti-Semitism. And so I want to be very clear, by the way, on some other aspects of this. The implicit threat always when you get into politics is that you are not allowed to have any nuance. You have to be for something or against something. I will never, ever, ever be that person. I think, as you've heard me say on this show, that it is really sad that there are Israeli families that are missing. Of course, that are, it's sad because they're innocent civilians and they shouldn't be involved in a conflict. It also pulls at my heartstrings and it makes me cry when I see the footage all over Twitter of Palestinian children that are being bombed into oblivion, when I see their missing parts of their body and this implicit threat, don't say it's sad. You're not allowed to say it's sad. It is sad. Of course it's sad. What kind of a monster are you if you don't think children being blown up is sad? You, you become what you hate, right? You, you are literally no longer a good person if you see a child 
that is growing up in that sort of existence anywhere and you feel nothing, that you feel that they somehow deserve it because of the actions of their government, really, right? We have no say over what our government is doing. If one day a group raises up and decides to bomb America, could you imagine if people said, it's not sad, American children are dying. It's just not sad at all. Again, I am not a coward. So to those people that routinely take me out of context and want to call me names, I want you to know that I literally do not give a shit. You are never going to control Candace Owens. Your actions are futile. You mean nothing to me. I reserve hatred and disdain for you. I think you're psychopaths. And what I wish to say to you, utter psychopaths, is this. Israeli children, young children, they have dreams. They don't want to be at war forever for the rest of their lives. Young, innocent Palestinian children, they have dreams too. And what they are growing up in is madness. And it is sad. But guess what? American children have dreams also. And what we are seeing right now is not good for the future for those children. I am unapologetically America first. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Did you know that a baby's heart begins to beat at just three weeks? A heartbeat is a child's only defense in the womb. At five weeks, a heartbeat can be heard on an ultrasound. And that's where Preborn steps in, rescuing 200 babies every day from abortion simply by providing a mother with a free ultrasound and allowing her to hear her child's heartbeat and see their perfectly formed body in the womb. I was just kind of like, Lord, if this is, you know, if this is the way, you know, let me know. If this is not the way, give me a sign, you know, before I walk through these doors. And I was, as I was getting ready to walk up the steps and touch the doorknob, you know, a guardian angel. And he just told me, he was like, baby, you don't have to go in there. And he was like, I know someone that can help him. Just to see the development of a baby that small, and I say baby because, I mean, he had little arms and legs, and <laughs> I mean, you know, it was actually a, a human, you know, and to see that and to have that physical and that contact once you look at that, I think it just pulls on your heart a little. <laughs> By six weeks, the baby's eyes are forming. By 10 weeks, a baby is able to suck his or her thumb. Preborn needs our help to save these precious souls. For just $28, you could be the difference between the life or death of a baby. And if you become a monthly sponsor, you'll receive stories and ultrasound pictures of the lives that you helped rescue. All gifts are tax deductible and 100% of your gift donation goes toward saving babies. To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby. Or go to preborn.com slash Candice. That's preborn.com slash Candice. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. But before we get into our first topic, you already know I'm going to say, if you are watching this video, hit the like button and subscribe as well. I don't know if it's up or down. We are so close to 3 million subscribers. Rachel Dolezal. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a stan. That's what the kids are saying these days. They're saying you got to be a stan when you like something. I think it's it stands for stalker fan. They've kind of put it together, and that makes you a stan for those of you who are not hip, like I am not hip. But let me remind you who Rachel Dolezal is, just in case you, you forgot, in case she's been memory hold somehow. She was the woman who spent more than 10 years rising to become a chapter president of the NAACP by posing as a black woman, just pretending that she was black. She also became a teacher of Africana studies at East Washington University. And suddenly, her parents started speaking out and were like, hey, I know she's kind of climbing the ladder as a strong black woman, but actually she's 100% white, and uh, that's just makeup that she's wearing, and she's kind of kinked out her hair. I'm going to show you a picture of Rachel Dolezal. They shared photos of her as a child, and that's her on the left, and here is her after she decided to blackify herself. You can do that. Did you know that? If you're a white person watching this, you have this as an option. You can blackify yourself. First time I've ever used that, blackify. I like it. It's staying. I'm a blackification stan. And so Rachel Dahl is obviously, it was a huge story. How could someone be pretending to be white? I mean, pretending to be black, pardon, for so long. And NBC swooped in and they asked her, like, hey, what's going on? Your parents are saying and showing these photos of you as a white woman. Are you actually black? And here is what she said. It's remarkable. Take a listen. I haven't had a DNA test 
there's been a biological proof that Larry and Ruthann are my biological parents. There's a birth certificate that has your name on it and their names on it. I'm not necessarily saying that, that I can prove they're not, but I don't know that I can actually prove they are. I mean, the birth certificate is issued a month and a half after I'm born. Um, it certainly, um, there are no medical witnesses to my birth. Well, I definitely am not white. <laughs> I'm definitely not black, by the way. I'm 100% Japanese. Yeah, I've seen a birth certificate from my parents, and they're not Japanese. But, like, I don't know. when I wasn't there. I, like, I was there. But I, I, I obviously don't know for sure when that birth certificate was issued. I'm Japanese. I just want to make it very clear that I am Japanese. And if you guys do any work and you actually find out that my parents are black, I just there's a more of a conversation that we should have about genetics and how they work and why I am, in fact, Japanese. It's brilliant. I love her. You know, when you just get caught in the lie, just go harder. You know, just go a little harder into the lie. Lackify the lie. So obviously, this disgraced her. It completely changed her life. She was sacked. NAACP stopped using her as the president. Um, and she had to just, I guess, change her careers but she's still identifying as black. So why am I a stan for Rachel Dolezal? Well, because all of this happened in 2015. I view her as somebody who was just ahead of her time. Yeah, in 2015, we may have still had a little bit of sense, but by now, my goodness, why couldn't you pick your race? You can pick your gender, right? You can, you can pick your species. We have people running around as puppies and dressed up as cats, and they are being affirmed in who they believe they are. We have men that are wearing dresses and they're being affirmed as women. They're being encouraged. YouTube is rewriting policies to make sure that we recognize that no matter what they say, even if it is plainly evident evidentially false, we, we cannot dispute it. It's all about how you feel. And Rachel Dolezal felt like a black person. So I think if she had just waited a little bit, she would still have her job at the NAACP. She, she was just a leader, is what she was. She was a leader in the category of insanity. Now, in case you're wondering, by the way, what Rachel Dolezal is doing and why she is back in the news, well, at first she tried to rebuild her image by starring in a Netflix documentary called The Rachel Divide. She then attempted to generate some income writing a memoir entitled In Full Color. Mm, don't feel like she actually is in full color. That didn't work out for her. She was eventually charged with theft by welfare fraud, perjury, and false verification for public assistance. So she committed some crimes. And the court documents revealed that she illegally received $8,747 worth of illegal food stamps plus $100 in child care assistance from August 2015 through November 2007. So listen, Rachel Dolezal is a whole fraud. Right. She's also probably a little disturbed to live out this dream of being a black person. But that never stops anybody at the Department of Education. Right. Because they're just like, uh, yeah, if you're doing that, I definitely want you teaching children. So unbelievably, Rachel Dolezal is today an elementary school instructor at Sunrise Drive Elementary School. Yeah. What does that really say about the state of things? We really are not picking from the cream of the crop. You know, I shouldn't say cream because she's black, right? But yeah, she's actually able to be in front of children and to teach them. So you can only imagine what that is. And if you are outraged, you have every right to be. Because of course, I am being facetious. This is utter madness. It is indicative of everything that is wrong in our society. And yet it is allowed to happen. And of course, because pornography is also one of the curses of our modern society, Rachel Dolezal is now doing porn. Yes, don't worry. I'm not going to show you anything that is too perverse. But if you don't want to see Rachel Dolezal in lingerie, you should avert your eyes. This is her. She is, by the way, making $19 an hour at school, but she also sells content on the explicit adult site OnlyFans for $9.99 a month. And yeah, I, I just can't even believe that this is a thing, but it absolutely is. And she's still allowed to keep her school job. Because why? We've gotten soft on pornography. We have. That's the truth. It's, it's everywhere. It's in ads everywhere. And now you are starting to see this as we cover 
extensively on the show that university professors, university, uh, there are even school principals that are now on OnlyFans. And they're like, what's the problem? What's wrong with this? America obviously has no morals and we are here to stay and to allow that and to spread that. So that's your update on Rachel Dolezal, ladies and gentlemen. All right, guys, moving on. I just wanted to very quickly point out that Nikki Haley has finally told the truth. I knew she would get there. I knew she would get there. Yeah, in an interview with NBC News' Craig Melvin, she explained away her past support for Donald Trump because now she's constantly saying things about Donald Trump. But clearly she didn't feel this way when she was working in his administration, when she was the, the ambassador to the UN. And she explained herself with the sentence that I just felt in my soul was finally Nikki Haley as we needed to hear her. Take a listen. He's upset because he thinks I'm disloyal. I'm not loyal to anyone. I don't do that. <laughs> I ain't loyal to anyone. I don't do that. I don't do loyalty. Yes, we are very aware, Nikki Haley, which is why you cheated on your husband multiple times uh, while he was, by the way, deployed overseas serving the country. That really makes you quite a despicable individual. She doesn't even contest it. The, the, the court documents have been revealed. People that were under oath testified that they were sleeping with Nikki Haley while her husband was deployed overseas serving the country. So no, ladies and gentlemen, she does not do loyalty. She certainly isn't loyal to America either, which is why she's always advocating like a rabid dog for us to fight every war everywhere because she knows who is writing her checks. She knows who clears those checks. And as Vivek Ramaswamy always pointed out, Nikki Haley's ultimate goal is to just retire and be wealthy. She got into politics and she was in debt. Unfortunately, the truth is, is that most of our politicians have sold out the American people. They get to D.C., they are lobbied by either the military-industrial complex, they are lobbied by Big Pharma, right, and they're suddenly simping for vaccines all the time, or, you know, they're like Nikki Haley and they're going to run, put a ton of money in her coffers, and at the same time keep pretending that her lack of loyalty should be perfectly acceptable. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't have been to her husband. It shouldn't be to the American people. But more power to her for just stating what has been so perfectly obvious to the rest of us. All right, guys, and finally, let's get to Tucker versus Ben Shapiro. Oh my gosh, the conservative world is melting down. You've got to take a side. What do you guys think? So very quickly to recap what has happened. Uh, obviously, Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro have different political philosophies. Uh, Tucker Carlson, I think, very much agrees with me. And I would say, as we talked about earlier in monologue, now Matt Walsh, that we just shouldn't be sending any foreign aid. And one of the things that has been particularly upsetting are people that just seem to be playing fast and loose with their words. Most notably, by the way, when we talk about these people, we're talking about people like Lindsey Graham, who is, I think, a lunatic, which is exactly how Tucker Carlson described him when he wrote this on Twitter. Hit Iran now. Hit them hard followed by Senator John Cornyn of Texas, target Tehran, like just tweeting people that are in our government, bomb a country, bomb a country. Like obviously that's going to put Americans in war. And Tucker Carlson was explaining in a recent interview to Russell Brand why that sort of language upsets him. Because like I said, he replied to that tweet and said, effing lunatics, right? Here's what Tucker Carlson had to say. You know, I've got four draft age children. So if you're playing recklessly, fast and loose with their lives, then I have a right to despise you. And I do. So if you're Nikki Haley who's running for president or Ben Shapiro or half the people I see on television casually mentioning the possibility of nuclear war or sending Americans to fight in the Middle East or in any way involving us in a war that has nothing to do with prosperity and peace at home, nothing, in other words, to do with us Americans – then I have a right to call you out and be really offended because it's my family. They live here. It's not a joke to me. It's, there's nothing abstract about it. And in reply, Ben wrote this on X. He wrote, Tucker is simply lying about my positions. I've been calling for a negotiated end to the Ukraine war, freezing the lines of conflict since early on in the war. I have never called for American boots on the ground in Ukraine, ever. I have never called for American boots to defend Israel, ever. I've invited Tucker to sit down multiple times over the past few weeks to clear the air and discuss our differences. 
He's said he's willing, but his team has told us that he's busy for months because of all of his foreign travel. That offer remains open. So here's what I would say. I think that in that clip, he wasn't just calling out Ben. And so I think that we're kind of conflating because Ben has a different position, obviously, than people like Nikki Haley or people like Lindsey Graham, who, as I just showed you, Tucker responded to. And there's varying extremes across that platform, which I would say Lindsey Graham represents the craziest extreme ever. He would quite literally put your children in war. And that's who I think Tucker is loosely referring to. Ben definitely, certainly... As le- at least as much as I have heard it, have, I've never heard him advocate to put boots on the ground. So he's being honest when he says that he has never personally advocated for that. But Tucker is just referring to a bunch of people who, as I said, have varying degrees of sentiment. Ben obviously has been very open about the fact that he does support foreign aid packages. He's, he believes that to some extent America has to do this to uh, preser- preserve freedom in the world. I don't want to you know, put words in his mouth, but he if you listen to his podcast, has an explanation for why he does think that we should be involved in terms of sending money to assist certain countries. But Tucker doesn't believe that because what Tucker is saying, and what I think that I would agree with when, what Tucker is saying, is that even if you send foreign aid, this could result in a war, right? You are aiding a further uh, conflict. If you're sending money to Ukraine, that means that the war is not going to stop, right? Because now he's got more money, Zelensky, to be able to fund this war longer. And what can happen in that process is that the war can escalate. So it could ultimately end up with Americans then having to involve ourselves further or just people hating us, right? How much money are we going to send before maybe Putin snaps and gets upset or people in the Middle East get upset and decide that they want to enact terror on American citizens, especially with this wide open border. You know, it it creates us just having a lot of enemies overseas. And I think that that's probably what Tucker is trying to say, that any level of involvement puts Americans at risk. And he has boys that might have to somehow be involved. Now, obviously, there is no draft today, but there have been drafts in the past when there were world wars. And I think that is a fear that a lot of people have, that we're going to somehow end up in a world war because we are just supporting too much overseas and also because we have lunatics like Lindsey Graham who are just saying things as if it represents the will of the American people. And he is saying things as a politician. It's very dangerous for him to be saying those things. So I think ultimately what will happen in this process is First and foremost, obviously, Tucker believes in free speech. He believes in disagreements. And eventually, the two of them will sit down and Tucker will explain his position further. And he's not going to bend on it. And Ben will explain his position further. And he's not going to bend on it. And people who respect Ben's positions are going to follow Ben. And people who respect Tucker's positions are going to follow them. It doesn't necessarily need to be read like a world war. It just needs to be read that we are not a monolith in the conservative movement and we all think different things and different ideas and different thoughts should just be permissible. We're experiencing a lot of global instability as we plunge into the new year. How do you protect your family in the midst of all this chaos? A great place to start is by protecting your savings. It's not too late to invest in gold with Birch Gold Group today. Unlike many other investments, gold can act as a safe haven investment during turbulent times by providing a hedge against inflation and economic uncertainty. Birch Gold will help you convert your existing IRA or your 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and it will cost you nothing out of pocket. While diversification does not eliminate risk entirely, Birch Gold's experts can help you manage and reduce, providing a more resilient foundation for your financial well-being. Talk to one of their trusted experts today. Just text Candace to 989898 and Birch Gold will send you a free info kit today. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers, Birch Gold has been the exclusive gold company of A Daily Wire for the past seven years. So text Candace to 989898 to claim your free info kit on gold. That's Candace to 989898. All right, guys, now let's move on and read some of your comments regarding episodes past. Yesterday, we did an episode and we talked about the history of what I refer to as the greatest Christian Holocaust that nobody talks about or even learns in school, which is sick to me, being the Bolshevik Revolution, which obviously brought in communism. It was vicious and it was despicable and nobody was made to pay for it. Jennifer writes, my grandparents escaped the Bolsheviks and fled to America. I heard the story my whole life. It shaped me. It also made me appreciate freedom. 
Sadly, it makes me not trust the government. I heard a particular story where my grandpa's uncle was shot because he was a well-educated man. That left his wife and kids to flee as well, and they were almost murdered. Wow. Again, one of the things that we saw across all of the comments was, I had never heard of this. I never knew this. I didn't know this many Christians were mass killed. And that's something that just really makes me angry, and I am just feeling so much passion right now for really talking about the persecution of Christians that happens all around the world, and Christians are constantly told to shut up about it. It's wrong. We should not shut up about the horrors that are taking place all across the world and in history. This person writes, Candace Preach, I come from Eastern Europe. My grandparents went through this. They were born in forests, hiding from bombs in winter. They didn't have shoes. Nobody's talking about them. And they were lucky because others died and didn't make it. This victim narrative has to end. Christians are the most abused in this world, and we are the most quiet. Amen. And I'd like to explore that. Why are Christians so quiet about this stuff? Why are Christians kind of beat into submission all the time? It makes entirely no sense to me. Kay Senya writes, Candice, I am very impressed by your critical thinking and analysis of the situation with Ukraine. I am Russian myself, living in the USA for many years. Everything you are saying, I knew from the very beginning of the war. And every time I tried to explain these things to Americans, people got mad at me. They were saying that I was drinking Kool-Aid of Putin's propaganda. After multiple arguments, I just gave up and shut my mouth. And now I am so very pleased to hear all of those facts from you articulated so correctly. Thank you. Being a subscriber to your channel and watch it religiously. Oh, please tell more of your friends to subscribe to the channel. And I do also want to add that somebody shared with me that that video uh, yesterday that we showed of the person that appeared to have Down syndrome and was running through the forest, they were saying in defense of the soldiers that were yelling at that person, he had done something which would have caused an explosion. And that was why they were so angry and pushing him because they all could have died. And that doesn't change the fact, by the way, if you're saying like that wasn't actually bullying, they were scared. It doesn't change the fact that any individual, especially that one who very clearly appeared to have some sort of a mental disability, shouldn't be in that war at all. It's insane that that person is anywhere near conflict whatsoever. And that was what was so particularly outrageous for me. So... Thank you, though, for adding that. I always want to make sure that we are accurate in what we are sharing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time that we have for today. We will see you tomorrow for a brand new episode.